Welcome, welcome to the Earth Innovation Institute webinar, Achieving Change at Scale in the Tropics, Jurisdictional Strategies and the Emerging Carbon Market. Um, I've shared some, some rules for our participants. Uh, the audience is all muted. Uh, please, if you have questions, and we do want this to be a discussion, not just a, a one-way flow of, of information, uh, submit your questions via the Q&A button. Uh, when you do so, please identify yourself, your name, and your organization. And a, a recording of this webinar in English, in Portuguese, and Spanish will be made available next week uh, to everyone who's, who's registered. Uh, just to provide a little bit of framing for our discussion today, it's, uh, I, I think, uh, tropical forests are clearly uh, a big part of any climate change solution and of course they're incredibly important for many other reasons besides climate as well. Uh, today global emissions of CO2 to the atmosphere from human activities about 10 percent of those emissions come from the loss and degradation of tropical forests. Slowing and reversing that loss could be as much as 20 percent or more <clears throat> of the emissions reductions that are needed by 2030 uh, to keep uh, the planet away from catastrophic climate change. However, the, the global trends in, trop in, in um, tropical deforestation, I seem to not know how to advance my slide here. Um, there we go. No one will accuse me of being a tech snob. Um, are sobering, you know, for over the last 20 years, these are Matt Hansen's data uh, and Global Forest Watch data. Uh, the top five years for deforestation happened in the last six years. And, and that there are certainly many reasons for hope. Some regions, uh, including in Indonesia, uh, we see, we're seeing rates coming down. But generally, we are, we're not winning this, this, uh, this battle. And as we end a decade with more attention focused on this issue, with more finance flowing into this issue than ever in history, it's a very important time to step back and reflect on where we are. The, the particular angle we want to look at today in this webinar is the jurisdictional approach. Uh, First of all, what is the jurisdictional approach? Uh, the, probably the easiest way to think about it is instead of the unit that you're really focused on being a park or an indigenous territory or a farm or farm sector, it's the whole thing. You're looking at entire political geographies like provinces, states, districts, etc., uh, so that you can connect to and resonate with the public policy process, the programs, uh, law enforcement that all operate in the context of those political geographies. Uh, by definition, that means that these are complex long-term processes and we'll hear about that complexity today. One of the very interesting things that is finally getting some traction is jurisdictional red uh, for carbon offset markets. And uh, that's just breaking open today you know, as hundreds of companies take on their climate neutral commitments, reducing emissions within their own uh, operations, offsetting what is, they're not able to reduce in their operations. The, the demand for high quality offsets with big impacts uh, is growing and hundreds of millions of dollars per year could be flowing into tropical forests through this mechanism in the coming years. Uh, and we'll hear a little bit about how that's playing out on the ground. The, um, uh, we'll, we'll start today with really a, a retrospective. What are some of the lessons learned from jurisdictional experiments uh, presented by Claudia Stickler? Uh, she will synthesize the results of a few different global assessments of jurisdictional approaches. We'll then move to the Peruvian Amazon where Patricia Luna will, will share with us uh, some very new strategies that have just been developed under leadership of the regional governments with some of the key lessons emerging from that experience. The governments themselves will be presenting the, those strategies uh, later on. 
And, and finally, we'll hear from Monica de los Rios uh, about two of sort of the pioneer jurisdictions that are uh, on the front lines for results-based payments and we'll soon uh, be moving into this new world I mentioned of jurisdictional uh, red offsets. So let me uh, begin by uh, turning it over to Claudia Stickler. Thanks, Dan. Um, let me, sorry, get back to the front here. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Um, so as Dan mentioned, um, I'm going to be drawing a little bit on this, um, some of the studies we've done in the past few years, uh, looking across jurisdictions in the tropics that have taken on um, a commitment to pursue jurisdictional programs. Um, so the first study, um, this is part of a larger collaboration with C4 and the Governor's Climate and Forest Task Force, um, is came out a couple of years ago and we plan on updating it next year. Um, the other study I'll be drawing on is an analysis we did of progress that jurisdictions have made towards um, meeting their Rio Branco declaration uh, commitments. And um, this is work I've done, especially in collaboration with my colleague um, Juan Argila and many other um, colleagues and partners. So here we'll be focusing on 37 jurisdictions that contain 28% of the world's tropical forests. Um, most of them were also included in our analysis of the Rio Branco um, declaration, um, not all. Um, some of the key statistics to know here is that um, the 37 jurisdictions, 24 of them have reduced deforestation relative to their frill, um, their forest reference emission level, which we have defined either based on the actual subnational frill that's been assigned or based on the national frill that was available to us. Um, they have achieved uh, 8 billion tons of CO2 equivalent in avoided emissions through that reduction. 35 of the 37 jurisdictions have taken on formal commitments under either the Rio Branco Declaration, the Under 2 MOU, or the New York Declaration on Forests. And 24 out of 37 of these jurisdictions have started or have begun designing and implementing really jurisdiction-wide strategies that are in at least intermediate or advanced stages of development. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. So first, I just wanted to start by showing the deforestation trend across these 37 jurisdictions. Um, I should say jurisdictions, not provinces. Um, as you can see, there was a big increase up until 2005 um, and then a steady decrease down to 2019. Of course, most of this is explained by what's been happening in Brazil. Um, a lot, there's been increasing deforestation in Brazil in the last few years, and Monica will talk a little bit more about that. Um, but, you know, what's interesting here is that across the board, there at least, there is some movement in the right direction, as Dan mentioned, and maybe some of this decrease being explained by Indonesian provinces. Um, one thing that we did is to look at um, progress towards jurisdictional sustainability on nine elements, which are listed on the left side of the slide here. Um, what we found is that those elements that are maybe most advanced or sort of where jurisdictions are moving into intermediate stages with those are the low emission rural development strategies and the multi-stakeholder processes. So those are definitely in different stages of development, but it's also promising to see that they are making uh, progress on those things. And, and I expect that when we do an update of the assessment next year, that we'll find that more jurisdictions have actually moved into this um, intermediate or advanced category with their integrated strategies, jurisdiction-wide strategies, in part because there's been emphasis from um, Norwegian and other funding to um, Governor's Climate and Forest Task Force members to develop those strategies and start implementing them. Um, where we saw sort of the least uh, advancement, uh, at least advances, is in the monitoring, reporting, and verification and on LEDAR finance. Um, and we'll talk more about the LEDAR finance later. We've also done some studies led by my uh, colleague Maria Di Giano on um, 
progress that jurisdictions have made regarding indigenous peoples and local communities. Um, so just diving a little bit into this case study of the Rio Branco Declaration. Um, it was launched in 2014, initially signed by 13 members of the Governor's Climate and Forest Task Force. Um, that number increased to 38 by 2018. Um, it was a precondition for receiving funds that were pledged by Norway um, by 2018. So what it asked for basically, what, it, what the government said is that they would reduce deforestation in their jurisdictions by 80% by 2020 um, if they received support from donor governments and private sector um, to help them with capacity building and, and pay for performance funds. And so when we looked at whether those signatories would meet the target um, in 30 of the, the jurisdictions that I presented earlier, um, we found that half of the study jurisdictions had at least made some progress. Um, four of them were likely to achieve the 80% reduction by the end of 2020. Um, the majority had at least one deforestation reduction target formally incorporated into their legal policy framework, but only two of those targets were equally or more ambitious. Um, the reasons underlying the progress or lack of progress really vary and depend on things like national context, um, timing in terms of when the agreement was actually signed, um, when they actually started undertaking their jurisdictional progress, political turnover, um, you know, deforestation history, um, all kinds of things like that. Um, and when we look at the question of how much finance um, the jurisdictions actually received in response to their request, we found there was only one direct response, and that was from Norway um, to the GCF um, task force members. Um, this increased the number of jurisdiction receiving funding pledges, but overall funds really didn't increase. So while we saw that nine jurisdiction initially had um, funding, uh, 30 had it in the period after the Rio Branco Declaration was, was signed. Um, what this means is that more jurisdictions received a, at least a small incentive to reduce deforestation or to at least implement their programs, but all received probably far less than necessary. And we also found that there was very little performance-based finance and, and Monica um, de los Rios will talk more about that. Um, only two states received that, Mato Grosso and Acre. Um, so what's really missing um, still we find is that we need greater and more sustained and more creative support for jurisdictions. You know, these are systemic changes that they're trying to undertake and those need time and they need support across political cycles. And that's particularly important. I think this is something that um, Patricia uh, has definitely seen with, um, with San Martin and other jurisdictions in, in Peru who are able to maintain progress on their jurisdictional programs across different political administrations with support. Um, we also need urgent support for jurisdictions with high remaining forest and historically low but rising deforestation. Um, that's still an area that's um, sort of, there's no solution for, including in the, the current um, voluntary programs like Art Trees and the Tropical Forest Standard. Um, and we also need more support and recognition at all levels of progress from early to advanced. So um, not just providing support to those jurisdictions that may have the most advanced programs um, or, or elements of their, their jurisdictional programs, but also those who are really just getting started because they'll need some sort of um, you know, indication that there's interest in them continuing. Um, and that's it for me today. There's obviously a lot that wasn't covered here, but I encourage you to look at those studies and also I'm happy to take questions at the end. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Claudia. That's a, uh, it's quite remarkable finding that, that jurisdictions with almost a third of the world's tropical forests basically made an incredibly ambitious pledge to reduce deforestation 80% by 2020 if the partnerships and finance were in place and and the response was quite small uh, really it's it's, it's uh, the direct response that uh, the study uncovered was a 20 the 25 million dollar commitment from norway which itself i think is is being put to tremendous uh, use and leverage as we'll hear from from, from Pat patricia but um so thank you for that next we're going to turn to the peruvian amazon 
some of the strategies, the, the low mission development strategies that Patricia will, will share and describe uh, are still being finalized. This is a very, very much a, a work that's uh, hot off the, the griddle, if you would. And Patricia, please share, share with us your, your lessons. Thank you, Dan, and welcome to all the people who is joining this uh, webinar. Today, I will share with you the results of the process of building seven letter strategies across Peruvian Amazon and also in our North Coast. This was a two year process led by seven regional governments, 13 uh, amazing partners, and also with the support of GCF, NORAD, uh, NICFI, and IKI. The process covered more than a half of Peruvian territories, so we have a lot of lessons learned under this process. But first, to start the presentation, I want to share that for us, a jurisdiction is a province, a department, and also a letter of strategy is a public regional policy and a, a roadmap to reduce deforestation, increase production, and improve uh, rural livelihoods. Uh, as Claudia explained, most of the jurisdictions has a commitment for reduce deforestation but very few has a complete roadmap to reduce or achieve these goals. That is why in the case of Peru, we build led our strategies using, using three analyses as a tool to know, uh, to build this uh, roadmap. The first analysis was the analysis of causes and mechanisms of deforestation and land use change to try to understand why deforestation is increasing in each region. The second analysis was a participatory review of bottlenecks of supply change. And the idea was to understand why we not increase uh, production to their best levels, but also why production is associated sometimes to deforestation. And the third analysis was an analysis, a geospatial analysis to identify if it's possible to continue growing in the areas without forests but also to see where are the most vulnerable forests in each region. The results of these studies show that in the case of Peru, deforestation is very variable inside each region and also between regions. Uh, also that deforestation is a very complex problem that has little connections with global markets. You will see the conditions that we have here for the perfect storm. So it's a very complex problem. And also there are a lot of agents involved and also levels of influence. We can have here smallholders and also big companies related to the forestation process. And also influence that will be at local level, for example, the soil degradation, but also process related to uh, international influence. For example, what happened with, when illegal uh, uh, gold uh, mining came to the scenario or what happens with, with illegal logging. And also we understood that uh, there is a, a key stakeholder in all this process that are the small landholders. That is how the deforestation trend looks in the, in the case of Peruvian Amazon. We have 18 years of uh, information and we still have 68 million of hectares. Also, we have lost 2 million of hectares only in this 18 period. We have lost more before that. But if you can see, we have small reduction of deforestation, but it's nothing to be happy about because we're still losing more than 148,000 hectares per year. And this is how deforestation looks if you take a deeper look in each department. You see that some regions or jurisdictions are reducing deforestation, like San Martin and Huanuco, other ones are increasing, and some ones are maintaining the same uh, deforestation rates. That is why you cannot assume that in the case of all Peruvian Amazon, we are low in deforestation. And if you take a deeper dive, you can see that inside each department, deforestation can change the trend between inside its, each province. This example is for Amazonas department that is near to Ecuador. And you can see, you can see for example, that Condor Canqui province, that is the yellow one, is increasing when, for example, other ones are maintaining or reducing. 
But after understanding the trends, we tried to understand why, the causes. And we found uh, this. Deforestation is a very complex problem. In most of the departments, we found more than 30, uh, 35 drivers. And deforestation is like this noodle uh, network. You can see, for example, the direct drivers like uh, coffee, cocoa, grasslands, roads, but after them, behind them, really, we have a lot of different drivers. For example, the low access to finance, low productivity, insufficient safeguards for public investment, corruption, low prices for good products, weak governance. So we cannot say that deforestation in Peru and Amazon is a one drive, driver process. It's a very complex process. What happened when we try to design solutions? First, we learned that we need to understand very well the process because it changes between one jurisdiction to another. The second one is that solutions should be tailored for each jurisdiction. And also that working package should consider diversity between drivers, stakeholders, and local conditions. This map, for example, is San Martin region. And that is how we build the letter strategy in San Martin. We divided the region in four parts, taking on account the deforestation process. And inside each part that is the green limit inside San Martin, we found that there are small units with different land uses. And for each small unit, we propose a working package that has solutions for economic, social, and also environmental problems that are related to deforestation. It's important to say also that the strategies must count the gender and cultural variation. We found that deforestation affects different to women and men in rural areas and also indigenous people. So we need that let our strategies could include this integrated approach, social, economic, and environmental uh, answers to the problem. Also, some causes could be addressed at interregional level between jurisdictions. They can agree and do partnerships to solve them. And sometimes, um, in the case of Peru, it's important, some uh, partnership at international level is needed because there are some illegal economies like illegal gold, gold mining or coca, uh, illegal cultivation that need support of bigger stakeholders. What we have learned, there is not a silver bullet. We need to build a tailored suit for each region. And this suit needs to be systemic, systemic to solve this complex problem, to respond to the internal and external drivers. It's important that these letter strategies can build a common vision of the future, because even when we have a high diversity of stakeholders, all needs to be built to be part of this vision. Unfortunately, in the case of Peru, we don't have enough, enough carrots. Even when we have reductions now, this is uh, giving a lot of uh, this initiative for the regional governments who are doing well their job. Uh, the, the actors who are doing the things right doesn't feel that they are having a, a incentive for doing the things right. So it's important to having the carrots and having the carrots fast. Otherwise, we are going to lose the opportunity. And a good point in the case of Peru is there is uh, two interregional spaces that can be a good opportunity. Here we have a coalition for sustainable productions that is a coalition of companies, regional governments, and also the Ministry of Agriculture and Environment who are trying to identify solutions to increase sustainable production to Peruvian Amazon. And also we have here the Amazon Commonwealth that is a partnership of regional governments who are trying to identify common public policies to improve the development of Peruvian Amazon. So we have a lot of conditions to make the things right, but we need to understand that there is not a silver bullet. It's not an easy solution for deforestation because it's a complex, very complex problem. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Patricia. Um, what an amazing story. Uh, I'm really struck by how the role of international markets in the Peruvian Amazon is, is really quite minor. And I think that's probably the case in most tropical uh, frontier uh, landscapes. 
And the real heavy lifting is regional planning. It's understanding the different drivers of deforestation and having tailored strategies for each one of them and getting those, those, those positive conditions uh, and, and, and incentives in place. Well, next we turn to Brazil and uh, Monica de los Rios uh, has a very unique perspective on this. She was one of the architects of the ACRI CISA program, working with the government at that time. And she's been very involved with the, the Mato Grosso uh, RED program as well. Monica. Thank you, Dan, for this introduction. Let me share my, my screen, sorry. Thanks everybody for joining us. Uh, as uh, Claudia mentioned it in Brazil, we have two states that already access carbon finance. The first one was the Acre state. Uh, uh, Acre was the first jurisdiction that received uh, money from RED in the model of payment based on results from the government of Germany uh, through the RED for early movers program in the end of 2012. Um, ACRE have been working in public policies since the end of the 90s for sustainability to establish uh, forest friendly development. And as you can see in the graphic of uh, evolution of the rate of deforestation, uh, the performance of the state is not for high, high or very high rates of deforestation. Um, also, um, during the discussion of, in the beginning, during the discussion of red and mechanisms at global level, CISA saw the opportunity to be compensated and value all the efforts that the agri state made to maintain uh, the rates and even also uh, continue to reduce the rates of the deforestation. So uh, in 2010, creates the state system of environmental services. And with this, uh, ACRI became the first jurisdiction that passed a red was law. Um, this, uh, with this um, framework, legal framework, uh, the ACRI state made the deal and received the first payment based on our results. Uh, later in 2013, uh, we have Mato Grosso that see the, seeing the, the ACRI experience uh, also established the red plus system uh, as a policy in the state. Mato Grosso is the biggest producer of commodities, soybean, meat, among others, and uh, always linked to the highest rates of deforestation, as you can see in the graphic of rate of deforestation here. But also, since 2006, is the biggest uh, decline in deforestation as well. Um, and in 2015, uh, Mato Grosso, through a multi-stakeholder dialogue, also designed uh, the produce, conserve, and include a strategy uh, with targets to increase the productivity, but also to conserve the forest uh, with social inclusion by 2030. Um, this effort just was um, recognized by the RAIN program through payment based on results in 2017. So it was a long time waiting for revenues and for, for recognition on these efforts. What we learned from those both states uh, is in both cases, they um, implement the uh, jurisdictional approach of RED plus mechanism. Uh, this approach can deliver important benefits for indigenous people and local communities. Both states designed their uh, strategies for benefit sharing, uh, considering who reduce the deforestation, but also those who conserve historically the forest. Uh, both states also designed the, their uh, red programs based in a long-term, broader strategies to change or, or to improve the model of development, the rural development for low emission carbon rural development. So in order to provide the continued uh, reduction on deforestation based on a new model of development. Uh, and it, it, this takes time. Um, also, 
the incentive um, is, is needed not just to load the deforestation, but to slow deforestation. We have in the Amazon region, not just Accra and Mato Grosso, but there is other states as well. We have Amapá and Roraima, for example, that have very lower rates of deforestation and uh, that needs to be um, maintained uh, at this level uh, and, and avoid to rise them. Uh, now we have, um, until now we have two states that receive favorite medicine on results, but we have nine states in the Amazon. Uh, even those states, Acre and Mato Grosso, that receive money from the RAIN program is still not enough to solve all the, all the problems that need to be fixed in order to avoid deforestation. So we need other opportunities and channels to uh, make or create the flux of money from red to those jurisdictions. The carbon market, the voluntary carbon market, the, the uh, uh, jurisdictional standards as the tropical forest standard from California and our trees standards to verify the jurisdictional offsets create this opportunity. Uh, just to see the Mato Grosso case is if the Mato Grosso state reduced the current deforestation in 30%, uh, they could generate uh, from 25 to 100 million tons uh, in the next five years. This represents a volume of uh, more than a hundred uh, million dollars uh, for the next years uh, that could come to the state and to, could make possible to distribute more benefits for those who are still waiting to be recognized as the agriculture sector, for example, that until now didn't feel the concrete benefits from red. Um, I will let here uh, with this um, slide uh, in order to to receive your question and maybe to have a good discussion on, on this. Uh, thanks so much. Thank you, Monica. Uh, I, I'm so struck by the amount that got done with a fairly small amount of results-based payment finance. I mean, just the Mato Grosso case is uh, fascinating because the REM contract would really cover less than 1% of the emissions reductions achieved within the boundaries of that state, which, which as Monica showed, has had an enormous uh, reduction in deforestation, almost 90% below the historical average. And so uh, the, one of these lessons is, wow, a little bit of, of well-placed finance can go a long way, but it's not enough to really carry the full transition. And uh, we're getting some, I wanna encourage everyone um, to come in uh, through the, the Q&A uh, box with your questions and answers. And I'm going to be uh, uh, fielding these questions, getting them to the right panelists. Um, we, we do have an initial one from Michael Wollison uh, uh, that I, I think is partly answered. And before I ask Monica her first question, um, you know, it's very important. There's, there's now two standards. One is the California Tropical Forest Standard uh, approved in September of 2019 after 10 years of negotiation. Um, <clears throat> but the California red market is not yet regulated. So, but it can be used for uh, voluntary market transactions. And then there's our trees uh, also recently uh, finalized. Uh, Norway has made a, a pledge of a minimum $10 per ton CO2 for jurisdictional red uh, verified under our trees. And Emergent is uh, actually attracting and building up the demand side of that for, for those uh, offsets. So today uh, we're aware of at least five Brazilian states, all Governor Climate and Forest Task Force members that are interested in verifying under our trees, uh, and there's probably more. At least two of those uh, have historical emissions reductions that they could sell next year. Uh, others, such as Mato Grosso, do not have historical emissions. Uh, one interesting aspect of this is that if your performance is more than five years ago, it, it actually reduces the amount of, of emissions reductions you can sell. But Mato Grosso could sell a lot, you know, beginning in 2022. So really interesting moment in time where Norway is basically guaranteed at least $10 a ton uh, and yet 
uh, there are plenty of buyers. There are plenty of buyers for these systems. So, Monica, um, you mentioned the, the benefits for indigenous people, and it really strikes me how there's this divergence in, in the community, the international community today, where red is often equated with uh, you know, threats to indigenous people's rights, and yet it seems to have had just the opposite effect in Acre and Mato Grosso, and particularly in Mato Grosso, I wonder if you could share what does that process look like to, to bring indigenous people uh, to the table? Uh, well, in, uh, it's, it was uh, very proud to be the witness of the process in, in the case of Mato Grosso. Um, it was a, a process leaded by the, the Federation of the uh, indigenous, indigenous uh, people and organizations uh, of Mato Grosso uh, that uh, in the process of discussion and negotiation of the REM program, it started to be organized in order to discuss how they will participate, if they will, and how the money that comes from the REM program could benefit them. It, it takes um, uh, consultation on the field, uh, on the communities, in the seven ethnic regions that the Mato Grosso has, uh, involve more than uh, 1,200 indigenous people. It's not just the technicians or the NGOs that support them, but it was involved indigenous people discussing what they want, what are the challenges, and how the red, uh, the red money could, them, could help them. So they participated in the decision making of design the indigenous territorial sub program. Also, uh, they became uh, as uh, they design how they will uh, how will be the structure of governance of the sub program and how they will participate on the structure of governance of the REM program of Mato Gros. So now they they are considered as part of the forum of climate change of the state and also have part of the discussion and decision making uh, regarding of the money that goes to the indigenous program. So this, it, it uh, and now uh, currently this year, the rent money uh, is coming to implement their plan of uh, the emergency plan to uh, face the COVID uh, impacts of indigenous people. So. Uh, and they obtained also the Nobel Chessim of the Germany government. So it was a very, very successful uh, case on involved uh, indigenous people uh, themselves and uh, maintaining their, their uh, autonomy. It's a fascinating story. 2015, I remember there was a single IP representative to the Forum on Climate Change in Mato Grosso, and today it is a it is across all indigenous people. That's an, an amazing step forward. Lots of work ahead. Uh, Patricia, uh, you know, towards the end, you mentioned these, uh, these new innovations that I think uh, deserve uh, maybe some, some more explanation. Uh, the Mancomunidades, the, the Amazon Commonwealth re recently created, but also the, the Coalition de Producción Sostenible. Um, which is, as I understand it, about 60 different members, lots of companies, governments, NGOs. Is it fair to say that there's a potential for a, a, a Peruvian Amazon-wide strategy that, so it's not just the individual regional government led our strategies, low emission development strategies, but could you describe those two uh, processes, the Mancomunidad and the coalition, please? Yes, Dan, there is a big opportunity for the Mancomunidad and also the coalition. The Mancomunidad is a, a partnership between regional governments in Peru that are in charge of each uh, jurisdiction. And they uh, did, did this partnership to design better policies for Peruvian Amazon. So I think that they have a lot of uh, potential because there are a lot of causes that need collaboration between uh, jurisdictions. For example, as a country, we need to finish to design this uh, payment for results mechanism. So I think that regional government uh, has a lot to talk about that or say about that. But also uh, there is uh, 
I really need to build a model for sustainable agriculture and production in Peruvian Amazon due to these special conditions. So I think that regional governments uh, through the Mancomunidad will help the Ministry of Environment, Environment and Agriculture to design these policies. And the coalition is a, a working group with companies. So due to the uh, deforestation process is related to uh, some causes uh, uh, about investments and how the things are doing on the field, companies could help to, sol to give solutions. For example, partnership between uh, companies and smallholders that can uh, give incentive for the people who is doing the things right. So the Mancomunidad is important uh, working space to these kind of partnerships and solutions. Thank you, Pachi. And, uh, you know, one of the questions that came in from Richard Erskine is uh, how are these processes supported? And um, just to make clear to everyone, um, the Governor's Climate and Forest, and, and Forest Task Force, um, in the context of the Rio Bron Bronco Declaration announcement in 2014, Norway stepped up and promised $25 million in funding. That funding, the first tranche, went to support uh, these low emission development strategy processes. So there's 35 of those coming to fruition this year. Uh, most of them are com completed already. And that is behind uh, the experiences that Pachi described. As I mentioned earlier, the governments will be presenting their own uh, strategies uh, later on. Uh, that's behind ACRI and Mato Grosso strategies. Uh, so all of these jurisdictions around the world have had uh, grants coming in to develop those strategies. And now there's another uh, grant process to support the implementation of those strategies. More money is needed, however. Turning to, uh, to Claudia now, um, one of the questions uh, I was hoping you could uh, talk more to is uh, one of the conditions laid out by the, the GCF members uh, through the Rio Branco Declaration was the need to have partnerships with, with private sector actors. Uh, and remembering that that was the time of the New York Declaration on Forests and companies stepping up. Now there's about 500 companies that have made some sort of a commitment to reduce deforestation. And how, th how, have, how have they done? How those, have those uh, partnerships materialized? Yeah, thanks um, for that question. Yeah, you're right. Um, during that time period, 2014, 2015, there were quite a few commitments being made on all sides of, of the equation. Um, and since then, nearly 500 companies, I think, have made commitments to source um, sustainable commodities in, in the sense of deforestation free or, or low deforestation or whatever. Um, I believe that of those a very small proportion, like not even 20% um, have actually been able to demonstrate any progress on those commitments. Um, and some of those have resulted in some partnerships with jurisdictions. So we found that uh, at least up until 20, 19, there were 11 declared partnerships between companies who had made those kind of commitments and jurisdictions um, that were in our study. Um, of those, only five have actually moved towards a more formal contracting stage. So I think there's still quite a bit of room, um, both for the companies to meet their commitments um, and by investing in these jurisdictions. Um, you know, what we know is that there's obviously a number of complications, um, you know, regulatory restrictions and complications and burdens that might make it hard for, for jurisdictions, um, issues of, you know, transparency, corruption, quality, and all those kinds of things. Um, and that's really one of the reasons that, you know, more finance is necessary, um, you know, in part from the private sector, but also from other sources. Thank you. And, and uh, we have been trying to understand what's inhibiting companies from, from entering into partnership. And, and one thing that's clear, that's cited by at least a dozen companies we've talked with, is that there's concern uh, about the risk uh, of, of engaging formally in these partnerships because you could become a headline. Uh, participation in jurisdictional strategies means that you're exposed to actors who are engaged in deforestation. And uh, so that it's a, I think there's room for optimizing the advocacy campaigns to 
push companies into deforestation instead of just creating risk around those who are associated with deforestation. The, um, Claudia, while I've got you too, uh, how big is, are these jurisdictional commitments? What, how big a piece of what the emissions reductions needed beginning in 2030, where we know that we need almost a 50% reduction below the 20, 2010 levels, if we're gonna achieve a 1.5 degree uh, warming of the planet or less, uh, it's almost impossible to do that now, but how, how big a deal is this? Um, well, I mean, I can speak to the commitment made under the Rio Branco Declaration and the analysis that we did very specifically there. Um, it's a big commitment, 80% reduction below the respective baselines. Um, what we found is that potentially, had they been able to meet that target, they, they would have actually achieved almost 6% um, of, of what is needed to meet the one or keep warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Um, under the current trajectories, and by current we take the, the past three years and sort of develop a trend on that, um, they could still achieve 3.7 percent of, of that goal. So it's still pretty significant. If we can help keep jurisdictions on the path they're on, and for those who are increasing deforestation, to really work on keeping it lower. So it's, it's not an insignificant um, contribution. Thank you. Uh, we've got some more questions coming in. Uh, please, uh, if you have a question, share it. Uh, from Bob Davenport, he writes, um, what about uh, if, if red is not addressing some of the hot spots? You know, he, he cites uh, Amazonas and Apui, uh, San Felix, Novo Progresso, and the state of Pará. Uh, uh, how can red uh, address those? And, and I, I think the, the answer would be, you know, if this model, jurisdictional red, is starting to generate enough benefits and more and more states decide to do it, you know, remembering that Norway has, has guaranteed a floor price of, of $10, at least for jurisdictions verified under our trees, um, that's what needs to happen. You know, the Amazon state needs a, a, a jurisdictional framework and it's got huge progress towards that end. And, maybe preparing to verify under our trees. But um, uh, I think that the types of, of land use planning and, and the issues that Patricia hi highlighted is so critical that there, there's not just a, a finance and you solve a, a, a the problem a relationship here. Uh, it's really up to those state governments and, and their own you know, zoning processes and their law enforcement. Um, I've heard many people talk about, oh, you know, there, there's no prospect for law enforcement in Brazil anymore because of Obama's reduced budget, et cetera. And uh, the states actually have very large law, law enforcement capacity. So, um, and I think that's what, what will have to be mobilized. Um, the, um, another question from Bob Davenport to you, Monica. Um, he thought it was very interesting, the positive uh, information about the Indigenous Peoples Program in Mato Grosso. It, could you speak to which specific tribes were involved uh, in, uh, in that process? Uh, yes, um, the, the, sub, the Indigenous Territorial Sub Program and the REM Mato Grosso Program, the objective is to achieve all the Indigenous territories. So it's a statewide sub program on the indigenous territories. Uh, the sub program was designed by them with line of actions uh, that could uh, make achieve benefits for make achieve benefits for uh, all the territories in different ways. Could be directly or could be indirectly. Uh, for example, they have a line to enhance the indigenous organizations. There are a few indigenous organizations that have their own capacity for financial management, for example. But the idea is to empower and to um, provide them the capacity to, to work by their, themselves. Um, and this could be an uh, indirect uh, way to achieve all the indigenous um, uh, people. Also, they can do directly presenting 
a specific projects for some line of, uh, of action of this program with a specific call for projects, for example, under this program by Combio. And uh, there are other things that could be uh, implemented directly by FUMBIO to support the communities that doesn't have organizations, uh, still doesn't have organizations at the moment. Uh, so the idea is to uh, provide a very diverse way in order to achieve all indigenous territories in some way. So it's truly a, a systemic approach to in, empowering indigenous people uh, very early on, but some interesting promising uh, results already. And uh, uh, we have a question from Marius von Essen, and that question uh, relates to whether or not the financing for addressing deforestation is going to be coming from grants from ODA type funding or from donor companies, or is the carbon market going to be big enough to carry this? And uh, you know, a very quick answer, and then I'll turn it over to Pachi, um, uh, Patricia. <clears throat> it strikes us that the carbon market will be a piece of what is a, a much broader solution. Uh, we haven't talked today, today about carbon neutral commodities. For example, that's something that's gaining a lot of momentum in Brazil. We haven't talked about the fundamental investability of jurisdictions. Many of these places are very hard to do business. And that needs to be a long-term goal of making them, uh, making it easy and safe to set up uh, low carbon enterprises uh, uh, in, the, in these places. And right now it's, it's hard, it's hard uh, uh, because of complexity, bureaucracy uh, and other issues. So, um, but I wanna turn it over to Patti because uh, the carbon market is moving forward in places like Brazil at the jurisdictional scale, but under the other places, there's some fundamental questions. And Patti, could you speak to uh, what you see as the role of uh, the carbon market, uh, this new demand for forest carbon offsets for the Peruvian uh, regional governments? Thank you, Dan. I believe that the carbon market could help to tackle these strategic investments that are needed in the region there is uh, no the unique solution they could help to this uh, to attract more private investment they could help to do these partnerships between companies smallholders or companies and indigenous communities but it's only one part of the solution because if we see the dimension of the investment needed market of carbon can only give one part so we need to be very wise to invest this money and that is why is uh, quick solutions are needed because if we take some time, maybe we can lose the opportunity to do these partnerships under actual conditions for example in the case of peru that are quite good to solve the problem now sorry okay i'm now unmuted uh, for Claudia uh, Stickler, we have a question from Claudia Homero from University of Florida. Hi, Claudia. Is there a sense of what have been de demonstrable social and economic be benefits of low emission rural development thus far? Um, hi, Claudia. Um, yeah, I, you know, it, it's obviously there's a lot more to look into um, to see the actual impact. But, you know, one of the things like Monica was just talking about sort of these actual tangible benefits that are starting and have been flowing to indigenous peoples um, in both Acre and Mato Grosso, I think is is one thing. Um, uh, what we've seen also is, um, I would say, you know, generally an increase in, in stakeholder engagement in those places where these kind of jurisdictional strategies are being developed, um, especially those that are being developed uh, through and with the members of the Governor's Climate and Forest Task Force. Um, I think because there's been an emphasis on, on that kind of process for building the strategies to make sure that they really both meet the needs of, of different stakeholders in those regions, whether they are stewards of forests or actual agents of, of deforestation, um, and also to build that kind of ownership. Um, so I guess in that sense, what, I, what I've looked at so far has been more these kind of in, 
tangible, co complicated, fuzzy sort of um, benefits. Um, I think we don't have good measurement yet of sort of these, you know, very direct impacts and would love to, of course, have a discussion with you about how we could get at measuring those kinds of things a bit better. And I'm sure my colleagues who are actually working um, in those regions have um, more insights as well. Yeah, any other, uh, I don't know, Pachi or Monica, if you, if you have a quick uh, intervention on that question, what are, what are the tangible social and economic benefits that you're seeing? Um, and in the case of Acre, for example, uh, it was possible to see how the government organized um, incentive to increase the productivity while continue to conserve the forest through smallholders or extractivists, for example, not just with a specific um, distribution of money from red, but uh, rather that um, uh, the uh, investing the, the money to enhance uh, some productive sector, for example. And, uh, uh, and this is trying to, to change the way of the land use and the behavior of the land use to be more efficient. And, uh, and as these uh, small producers need help or the extractivists need, needs help also uh, to be more efficient or to be more dignified, uh, this kind of money can arrive to improve that. And this is the sense of the benefits that could achieve uh, this kind of uh, stakeholders on the field. And Pati, Peru has not seen really much carbon finance reach the ground, but are you still seeing benefits from the process itself of constructing these low emission development uh, strategies? Yes, there is a lot of benefits, but I want to share also some ideas about how to include these social and economic goals in the letter strategies, because as I explained, uh, deforestation includes uh, social and economic causes. That is why letter strategies should include goals for uh, increasing the quality of livelihoods in rural uh, communities and also how to increase competitiveness in each region. All Peruvian strategies include now, for example, not only goals for reducing deforestation, also goals for increased competitiveness, goals of increasing, uh, for example, the amounts of and the quality of uh, some products that each region exports, and also uh, how to increase, for example, the access for education and health. So I think that the, the change of the, uh, the of the idea is that let R is not possible without including these two pieces in the strategy of work. Uh, Great, thank you, Patricia. And uh, we have another question from Tim Kyleen. How big is the demand for uh, red offsets uh, coming from the airline industry? And uh, many of you probably know that the airlines have agreed to offset uh, uh, emissions in excess of their 2020 values and then COVID happened. So actually emissions from air travel have gone way down. So it'll probably be about five years before that can, can commitment made by the, the Air Civil Aviation uh, Association uh, comes to bear. Individual airlines, on the other hand, have stepped up and are uh, moving into this space and starting to buy offsets. Um, I should just say though that the the demand is growing very rapidly. It has not been seriously uh, held back by um, COVID-19. And uh, right now, all jurisdictional red offsets that become available will have buyers. And, um, and Emergent has, a, I believe, about 30 corporate buyers. And uh, so anyway, we are at the end of our time. I just want to say a, a closing a comment, and that is, uh, there's an emerging picture of jurisdictional strategies uh, in which the international community really has not yet made a very compelling case for these regional societies to uh, move down the pathway of forest-friendly development. Uh, one of the things that uh, is, is prominent in the international approach to jurisdictions 
is bar really borrows from market uh, transformation theory and and that idea of setting a very high bar and rewarding those actors who get beyond that bar we see that in certification uh, and what is really needed however I, and i think pati just spoke to this very eloquently is uh, benefits being delivered along that pathway and benefits not just for those who are directly engaged in keeping forest standing, but, but benefits for health, for economic opportunities, for education, and uh, for food security, which is particularly prominent this year in COVID, where there's a lot of unemployment, people going back to their fincas and farms to scrape by and scrape a, a living. And um, the um, so I think as we move into this new new uh, decade, uh, the challenge really is, okay, the carbon market seems to start to be getting some traction now. That is not big enough to carry it though and uh, to carry these transitions. We need a, a more of a collective approach that's really surrounding these aspiring jurisdictions with the recognition, the positive incentives, the partnerships, the technical assistance, and you name it, that they're going to need to move forward. So I thank you all for participating today. Great discussion. I thank our, our, our panelists. I thank you, uh, the participants, for the, the questions that you, uh, you raised. And uh, look for uh, this recording uh, next week. And versions in uh, Portuguese and Spanish will be also available quite soon. So thank you all. <laughs>